Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our live coverage here at GFN24. I'm Brent Stafford, host of RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com and GFN Interviews. And I'm here with some guests that are all Commonwealth countries. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. I think yeah. we all have the queen, well, now the king, on our currency. That's true. <laughs> so you'll have to excuse me. I, I can barely speak. There's been so many interviews that I've already done today for GFN interviews. So I'm going to use my script here a little bit, too. So um, joining us today for this special half-hour live panel discussion on what's wrong with the Commonwealth <laughs> are three eminent commentators <laughs> and hopefully soothsayers. Representing Australia, we have Fiona Patton, harm reduction activist and former member of parliament for Victoria in Australia. And representing the United Kingdom, we have Martin Cullop, prolific writer and harm reduction advocate and international fellow at the Taxpayers Protection Alliance. And representing Canada is Maria Papayawanu, national vaping activist and harm reduction activists. So, man, are we going to be able to fix what's going on, uh, what's going wrong? Personally, I just think we should become a republic and literally leave the <laughs> Commonwealth, but um, that may not fix Australia's problems anyway. Mm. Martin? Um, I, I don't know what to think. It's, it's, it's a shame that the Commonwealth countries seem to be going backwards on, on, mm. in this respect to harm reduction, but some countries in Asia... Latin America and, and smaller countries in Europe are, are stepping forward in the right direction. So it's a bit disappointing. Maria? I think we just, again, I learned something today. And it makes more sense. The role of Minister of Health politically is a stepping stone or a stepping down for a politician. Oh. And mm -hmm. if we think about it, um, Minister Mark Holland was this great leader. Minister Mark Holland, for those of you that don't know, is the Minister of Health and the one that has decided that vaping he has to get rid of, um, was the leader, um, had a lot of roles. He was the whip at one time, had a lot of big roles in government, and now he's been stepped down mm -hmm. to the Minister of Health. Um, I think once we get rid of good old Marky boy, we might be on the right path again. So I think it should be said that, of course, there are other countries in the Commonwealth, yes. and some pretty big ones like India, but there's a specific thing that we're trying to get at here. Maybe it's the white progressiveness mm. that is in our countries, but there's something uniquely strange and special uh, about Canada, Australia, and the UK. I'm hoping that we can tease out what that might be. In Canada, of course, we've got uh, a flavor ban potentially coming down. Uh, in Australia, while well, you've abandoned harm reduction. Yes. Yeah, totally. Well, it will, yes. I mean, certainly for tobacco anyway. Yeah. For, for other drugs, we're, we're actually moving in the right direction. Yeah, so why? Well, and that's typical in all mm, three mm. countries. Let's start there. Why? Can you explain that contradiction? You know, I, I can't explain it, but we have... So, for example, we have 2,000 opioid-related deaths in Australia, which I know in compared to North America is a small amount, but we have 20,000 deaths compared to tobacco, for tobacco. Now, we will open up supervised injecting rooms um, to, in, to, to ensure and to, to help people not die from an opioid-related uh, overdose. However, you know... <laughs> 80% of those people also smoke. Um, but we would rather they were just abstinent in their smoking, but we will give them methadone or hydromorphone, we will give them an opioid replacement. I, I think it's a moral issue. I think there's some issue that um, people who use other drugs can't help themselves, where people who use tobacco just should know better. Martin, let me just first add that you know, for the longest time, the UK was really seen as the bastion of common sense and, and leadership mm -hmm. when it came to vaping and safer nicotine products. But that's not the case anymore, is it? Well, yeah. I mean, every, every year we come here, um, mm. poor, poor, poor old Fiona has to <laughs> apologise for Australia. <laughs> so, uh, but this year, I've, I've got to come and you know, apologise for the way the UK is acting at the moment, which well, is... It's only because um, you listen to bloody Australia. Right? <laughs> well, you know. well, that's one aspect, yeah. There was, uh, the, the, I was going to say, you know, that the government we've got, I think, is fairly weak, and that's just not the governing party. All of the parties mm. seem to be weak on this. 
um, the media last year, almost there was a firing gun started. And from the 1st of January 2023, we had an avalanche of, of bad media about harm reduction. Yeah. Um, there was one day in about March when it was getting to a real peak. And the Daily Mail had three anti-vaping articles on the same day. It was, it was, it was amazing. The Times has gone massively anti-vaping. The Guardian always really has been. Um, all of the tabloids, everyone seemed to be attacking vaping. Um, and it all because there was an uptick in, in youth vaping. And th but this media was incessant. And I think we've got such weak people in our parliament now that, that they, they, they caved, they collapsed to all this pressure. Uh, they didn't even wait to see if this was a blip. They didn't wait till the next youth vaping numbers came out. They've just been pushed into it. And, and so they were talking to the wrong people. We had public health who were still mm. saying, these, these products are fantastic. Don't, don't you know, throw the throw the baby out of the bathwater, don't kill the golden goose. Yeah. Um, uh, but they're not listening to them. They, they, I don't know who they're listening to. But, for example, we had a proposal in the budget in March um, that the Chancellor said he's going to bring in, uh, this, is, this, is, this year, he's going to bring in uh, vape duty, a duty on vapes. And it's, it's a massive, massive amount of money. It doubles the cost of a 10 mil bottle of, uh, more than doubles of a 10 mil bottle of liquid. Um, and when you look at the documents behind it, it's quite clear that it's been nowhere near anyone with public health experience. They haven't been talking to the right people. And I, I seem to think that they are talking to the wrong people. They seem mm. superficially to think that the Australian experience is a good one. They think that sounds feasible, or, you know, prescription only. That's, that's how to keep it out of, out of the hands of kids. And so they're talking to those people rather than talking to the public health who would like to talk to them but aren't getting access. And I think it also comes down to we have you know, weak leaders at the moment who, who just don't like be, being seen an outlier. They don't seem to recognise that instead of being a bastion and a world leader in harm reduction and something that the world is looking towards for, for guidance, they seem to think that they're an outlier and they need to just go along with the herd. Right. And that, I think that's right. making all the wrong decisions. Maria, Martin just mentioned taxes, vape taxes. Now, Canada, we talk a lot about flavour ban. I want you to explain exactly what's going on with that. But... Importantly, though, too, though, there is a massive tax increase coming, too, as well. Yeah. So here's the parts that we don't understand. Um, obviously, one minister isn't talking to the other. So our Minister of Health isn't talking to the Minister of Finance. Mm -hmm. So in our recent budget, there's a lot more going on, but we'll stick to the tax. Um, they have off, they increased the, t the vaping tax by 12%. However, this vaping excise tax, there was an offer made to the provinces, states, for those of you yes. that don't know what a province is, um, that if you want to join our program, you can match it. So what's happened now is um, many provinces have offered to match the tax, which is, you know, at so, if for some some products, $20. So it goes up by, tw uh, by another 10. So taxing yeah. is about 10 plus another 12% increase. So we're looking at, and I do bad math, so you guys, this is my math, 124% increase. That's what I'm going to say it is. Um, like that, July 1st. Very little communication to have that done. So then, great. So we have this tax. We have all these provinces going in because it is millions upon millions of dollars for a country like Canada. That's great. Let's add to the fact that our wonderful Minister of Finance said, let's have a national drug program so everybody in Canada gets free drugs. And before you ask how I'm going to fund this, I'm going to fund it from this 12% increase on the vape tax. So great, we are going to fund drugs for everybody, which I have no problem with that. Then comes Minister Holland. We, who has the mark here who's the noisy one? Mark Butler. Yeah, yeah so we both have a mark. Yeah. Um, so... Then Mar Mark, Marky Mark, Pinocchio, whatever you want to call him, says, I'm going to ban flavors. And so here's the problem is we have this huge increase in tax, which is fine. Then we have Marky Mark saying, I'm banning flavors. We have our Minister of Finance, Chris Jeff Freeland, saying, we're going to fund our drug program with a vape tax, but there's nothing based on the flavor ban that will be available on the market because currently there is not a single product created by any of those ingredients. So literally everybody's lying to the Canadian public and no one cares. No one cares because it's about people who smoke and our systemic beliefs as a nation have carried over 
And this is why you can pick on people who smoked, but not any longer, because right across this, around, right around this world, people who have switched to vaping are getting educated. And through that education of understanding, they feel empowered and empowered allows them to be engaged. And I, you can see that happening over and over and over again. The more we educate and the more we're educated on a topic, the more empowered we feel to speak up. And it kind of shocks them when we do things. So we're all over the place in Canada of lies. And so we're never going to get free drugs if we're <laughs> waiting on vaping. Well, so let's talk about um, the weakness. And I want to turn this to Australia because mm -hmm. it, it seems that Australian legislators and public health and tobacco control there are projecting strength. But mm -hmm. is it really strength? Absolutely not. And it's, um, it's, it's hubris. You know, they... They, you know, it's around, well, we beat big tobacco and we can do it again. Now, we have approximately 1.7 million vapors um, in Australia. So, no, they haven't stopped vaping. <laughs> I mean, certainly they don't tax it because the motorcycle gangs sell mm -hmm. the, the vapes. Um, it's, it's criminal organisations that sell vapes. So, um, we, they have completely lost it. They, but they don't particularly care. Mm. They don't particularly care. They can tell the, the, the mothers at, at, at school pickup that they're doing what they can to protect the children. Um, meanwhile, they're not caring about our Indigenous population that has 40% smoking rates. They're not caring about the low socioeconomic people in the outer suburbs who have got 30% smoking rates and cannot afford the $50 a packet mm -hmm. it costs for tobacco. Um, but, um, well, they don't pay that because they buy the illegal tobacco from the crime gangs and the biker gangs um, for $10 a packet. So they're, they're, they're losing tax. Um, they're, they have left this large growing market to criminal syndicates, um, but they're being tough on big tobacco with the one exception that the one... We have two legal products in Australia that you can... If you happen to have a prescription, if you can happen to find a doctor, afford the $80 it costs to see the doctor to get a nicotine prescription and then find a chemist that will sell it to you. Um, it's a Philip Morris product. Mm -hmm. So the actual only product is a big tobacco product. Right, right. <laughs> so is the hatred of big tobacco the thing that joins, you know, all of us together in the Commonwealth? It, yeah, maybe. I, I don't think they hate big tobacco. Here's my theory. Ah, okay. I think they like big tobacco because they're an easy, controllable enemy. Mm. Big tobacco, first of all, who's scarier? A CEO from a tobacco company or the CEO of a biker gang? So our Minister of Health, Marky Mark, said, I will find you in any dark corner and I will get those tobacco company guys. Dude, you're not doing this with the Vietnamese a mafia that's going to be selling fentanyl-laced vapes. I'm going to get in so in trouble by the Vietnamese mafia one day. <laughs> um, I don't even know if one exists. But he's not going to go after gangs. And that's the same thing. Yeah. They love big tobacco. They love the money that they get from them through the taxation. And then they also love the fact is that they're easy to control, they're easy to manipulate, and they back down. What tobacco <laughs> company stands up against the government? Very rarely. Yet, though, big tobacco is the foil I, for I the main. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, 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 a, it's a very convenient whipping boy. Yeah. And I think you're probably quite, quite correct. But no one disagrees with, with a minister who uses big tobacco in their yeah. sentence. If they say big tobacco, yeah. you know, every mom and dad goes, oh, oh, everybody says, oh, yeah, well, they're terrible. Remember them. Oh, yeah. God. <laughs> but they would say the same about the mafia or a biker yeah. gang, but they won't use those words. They're going to use big tobacco because they're mm. a legal thing that they can regulate. What, what's scary about a regulated industry? I, yeah. I don't think in the UK <laughs> it's, it's a fear of big tobacco. I mean, I think it's just um, a fear of, of youth vaping. They've, they've massively over... Um, overemphasized the problem, and and now they've created almost their own, own minds this hysteria, mm. which they're now acting on in the wrong way. I mean, the, the good thing compared with Australia, especially, is we're still going to have vaping products in the UK, yeah. so we're still much better off than many 
countries in the world, it's just the, the offering will be a bit degraded. You know, we'll have a very big uh, tax on the liquids, which will catapult us from, from the least in Europe to the highest in Europe, I think, I think it's right to say. Uh, and, um, and that doesn't really help things because they're talking about having this, this generational age ban on cigarette sales. But at the same time, they're, they're massively raising the cost of the alternatives. So it's not very, very much joined up thinking. They're not thinking it all through. And, and, uh, and I said, there's, they did a consultation and many public health organisations were saying, please don't get rid of flavours. Please don't tax uh, these products too highly. And they've done that already. Um, but it looks like they're going to have... Uh, we're in a, an election at the moment. So, uh, but all three parties have got the same manifestos on this. Mm. They all want to bring back the bill and, and go through with it. So they're going to probably bring in plain packaging, they're going to restrict flavours, all the things public health have said, please don't do. But they're not talking to public health, they're talking. They, they're yeah. just talking based uh, on the pressure they're under from the public. You I know, think. and I think it's interesting, when I, when I think of the Commonwealth countries, so when we first started seeing the bans on um, nicotine products in, in Australia, we were pointing to Canada, we were mm -hmm. pointing mm -hmm. to the UK, we were pointing to New Zealand going, look at what our brothers and sisters are doing in the Commonwealth. And instead, they were pointing to China, Indonesia, um, <laughs> India. Okay, India is part of the Commonwealth, um, where the, the, there were these there were these bans. And it's like, since when do we want to be China? Like, <laughs> you know, wouldn't we, you know, mm. I mean, we always want to beat New Zealand in everything. And... Um, you know, and now we're, we're losing against them yeah. miserably. Well, you are winning. You got higher smoking rates. Yeah, well, that's actually... <laughs> when you put it that way, Marie, yeah. maybe, maybe that's... Yeah, that's mm. our end So you're getting, you more tobacco tobacco winning, yeah. Yeah, getting more tobacco tax. We are winning. We're getting more... We still get $2.4 billion in tax. Yeah. yeah. yeah Fiona, you mentioned um, in a previous interview with me that you felt that tobacco control in and of itself has become... Possessed with their own yeah, self-worth. That's right. And, that's, and it, it certainly is that. And I think Australia in particular, um, you know, we, we won the war on plain packaging. You know, we got plain packaging. You know, we got some of, our most, some of the more, most restrictive point of sale um, legislation through that has now, you know, follow, has now been copied in a number of jurisdictions. So there is this misplaced pride. There is this hubris um, amongst our tobacco control people in Australia. And certainly the, the government that is in today, the, the Labor government, um, they initiated some of those measures. Mm. So they feel like they've, you know, that, the, that this is just continuing the good work that they did. I mean, when you look at the party that is supposed to be for the working man, this is one of the worst things that they can be doing for um, workers. So tobacco control is venerated in Canada, the UK, and Australia. That's right. Is that what we have in common? Mm. Is that yeah. what we have in common? Well, ours just one-upped you. We have cigarette warnings on every cigarette <laughs> now. <laughs> That's true, uh, we, well, we, well, We've one-up, like, because we've got a competitive guy there. His name's Rob Cunningham with the Cancer Society, <laughs> who also praises New Zealand on being under five yet he ignores the fact of how that happened. Mm. But we now can, when you're smoking a cigarette, you'll know that it will cause impotence. There's also in Canada that's often not discussed, and Martin, we talked about it uh, during our COP10 coverage. What's that group again, the global GA? GFTC. Is that G what it is? GATC, yeah. G -T and they're, Health Canada pays them. Yeah. Yes, and they're, they're Canadians. It's global. Yeah. They're the ones that were in the room with all the delegates twisting arms. Yeah, it's a Global Alliance for Tobacco Control, which right. used to be called the Framework Convention Alliance. And they're uh -huh. NGOs that are aligned with the, uh, the, the thoughts of the WHO and the mm. Framework Convention uh, Secretariat on, on harm reduction. So they're in there sort of chiving the, the, um, the delegates along to agree with the WHO. Yeah. And if you don't, they'll give you a nasty award and, and, yeah. and, and, and sort of wave, wag their finger at them. <laughs> so are they, I, they've got the to be thing. acting domestically. Yes, because it's Rob Cunningham. He is the guy who hands out the awards and does the thing. Sorry, Rob mm. Cunningham's my yeah. nemesis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I well, don't know you, if I'm his, but... <laughs> we've got... So, I mean, our Cancer Council in Australia, um, one of the biggest donors is Woolworths and Coles. Coles, they donate millions of dollars to them every year. Of course, Woolworths and Coles sell the most tobacco <laughs> um, products in Australia. They, they sell more than every other tobacco outlet combined 
and the, and the Cancer Council accepts their donations willingly and happily. And when I've challenged them on it, they just say, don't be ridiculous, Fiona. Of course Woolworths is fine. And it's, we don't get it from the tobacco money. We're getting it from the milk money. You know? Yes, because it's all like separate. Like they're hypothecating it. No, they're not. Maybe that's another thing to talk, look for the commonality is the fact that these organizations, the cancer, the heart, the lung, mm. they're venerated. And, yeah. and nobody really knows what the heck they do. Like if you asked one out of, you know, 10 people on the street, what do they do? And they'll say, oh, they do research and oh, they're fighting cancer. Well, no, they're a charity mill. That's, yeah, well, you know, and cancer rates are, raising, are going skyrocketing in all our countries. So if they're trying to stop cancer, they're doing a very bad job. Well, um, they use fear, they use misinformation. And when you lie about one thing, mm. You're not going to trust. You're not going to be trusted by the other things, and you're looking at, you know, our cancer society, cancer society, heart and stroke. They're they're misrepresenting the data. They're cherry picking, and the very people who they're trying to stop again, the youth, they're a lot smarter. Mm -hmm. They can actually go and fact check you a lot quicker than a 65 year old who smokes. Yeah, and that's where the problem lies. Is their techniques to get kids not to vape have failed because their techniques are working on the people who are still smoking. And I think this this goes to that sort of the media, you mm. know, that you're seeing in the United Kingdom. I mean, I think we're seeing a level of censorship uh, around um, around this issue of tobacco harm reduction. You know, you we we actually tried to get a, a fellow from New Zealand. Great Ben Udan to come and he came to Australia. We put him in front mm. of politicians. We 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 said we contacted the press club and said this will be a great talk on tobacco harm reduction. It's a really you know uh, it's a really um, interesting issue. People are people are engaged with it and they went no we're not having tobacco harm reduction at the press camps the press club. You try and put articles in. You try and give information to journos. They they will not touch you. They will run all of the the extreme and, and mm. sca scaremongering stories, but it's so difficult to get tobacco harm reduction. We, we had something similar the, in, in the, the UK, because uh, Rishi Sunak uh, suggested he was gonna bring in this uh, tobacco and vapes bill, which included the, the age, the ever rising age for mm. sales of cigarettes. And, um, and they, they, when it got to committee stage, they chose a committee, all of which had voted for this. And there was a, a, a load of MPs who voted against it. Every single MP oh, on the committee was in favour of the legislation. And when they called in the, the uh, witnesses, all of them were in favour of the legislation. They, it, they excluded any trade associations. Mm. They excluded consumers. It was like a mini cop yeah. meeting, you know. Um, but unfortunately, we have an election. All the manifestos are saying they're going to bring that back. We just hope this time they'll go through the proper process because I think they were trying to rush it through before any sort of election happened. Mm. So fingers crossed. And in the lead up to an election, no one's going to do anything, are they? No. You know, no one wants to piss off anyone. I mean, we're no. trying to say that in Australia, that, you know, you've got 1.7 million voters who are vapours. And, but given that they're so stigmatised, there's no regulated market, it is so difficult to, uh, to, to mm. engage them and, and, and organise and organise them um, in, in a way that is, we've probably found easier with even cannabis. Um, consumers. Oh my fact, goodness, we, need to, we need to get the United <laughs> States to uh, groups there or at least, you know, external money there to like run, like to fund and run on commercial television uh, public service announced ads mm. that talk about the benefits of vaping. Yeah. Because we can't do that in Canada. We mm. can't do that in the no. UK. We can't do that in Australia. No. It was that I went to go get an ad on World No Tobacco Day that said, World No Tobacco Day, simple font, Congratulations on the way you quit. That's it. You know, nothing about vaping or whatever from Rights for Vapors. And because it was from Rights for Vapors, they considered it a promotion of vaping. And they would not allow me to buy an ad for the Globe and Mail. So we can't, you can't purchase ad space and you can't get earned media, mm. which is the term, you know, That's right. that you That's use right. to get, you know. So what do you do? You know, I, and it's remarkable because I, I speak to journos who I know vape. So I'm, I'm speaking to, to journos that I know are on my side and they cannot get it past their, their editors. So certainly, I mean, you can bypass and you can try and use social media and certainly, you know, or, uh, people like yourself, Brent, you know, helping getting that message across. 
but when you don't even have a regulated outlet. So we mm. were, in the consumer group, we were talking about how can we get the manufacturers and the retailers to get further yeah. engaged in, in this program. In Australia, we don't have legal retailers, so we can't, mm. we can't engage those. But in the UK and Canada, you know, it's, it's probably really yeah. important that we start well, engaging. But you can't, you're technically not allowed to really promote vaping inside of eight yeah. you're. Well, you cannot, so we, <laughs> you cannot promote vaping inside a vape store, so you can't do any relative risk statements unless you have the full study there that yeah. you offer them. <laughs> and wait a second, this is the part that I love. Guys, I might be off with my numbers, but it's just as dramatic. So if you tell someone that vaping is safer than smoking mm. to sell them that product and you don't ha hand over the, the science, um, that is a $50,000 fine and plus and or, well, I'll say plus, 18 months in a federal penitentiary. Now, say you sold that product you sold that product based on telling that to someone under the age of 18. So we're going to add on something else. That's only a mere $3,000. <laughs> so we have a youth epidemic in our country. However, you sell to a kid, it's 3,000 bucks. You tell that same kid that it's safer than smoking without giving them the study. Whoa, you're in prison for 18 months. At a federal one, this is where mastermind criminals and murderers go. Like, can you imagine in the slop line? What are you here for? Well, you know, I murdered this. Oh, this is where I was going to swear, but I'm not going to. <laughs> so, you know, I murdered my ex-husband because he was this and that. And how about you? Oh, well, I told someone va vaping was safer than smoking. <laughs> Think about the optics. Yeah. Well, we have, we have, I mean, we have, we have states in Australia where the possession of all drugs is, has been decriminalised. Mm. So if you're found with heroin or methamphetamine, mm -hmm. um, it's a, it could be a civil penalty, but it's education. Um, you found with nicotine, two years jail. <laughs> so I think we've got just about four minutes left, maybe a little less, but around that. So let me toss this out then as like, you know, gasoline into the fire. Okay. So if we're looking at, because I believe it, there's a progressive issue that's mm. going on. Mm. And I, and I. Yeah. Yeah. So if that, if that is indeed the case, you don't believe much in the individual. The society, the social organism is a priori mm -hmm. to the individual. Individuals are not born bad. They're all born good. So if one of your little Johnny or little Jane has gone bad, it's not because of little Johnny or little Jane. It's because this, something's wrong with the society and the social organism. Very convenient to lay that on big tobacco. Yeah. And Almost in a way, big tobacco is, as the foil is actually part of the balancing act of progressivism. They, they, to believe in what they believe, you must have big tobacco and you must still be able to fight it. And so vaping breaks that down. Yeah. You know, it's sort of like whoever, whoever yeah. mentions Hitler loses the, bat, loses the <laughs> argument. You know, it's kind of, it's, it's a similar thing, you know, sure. except, you know, yeah. you, you mention big tobacco and you sort of feel like you've won the argument. But it is, it's the same thing. They, they go to that, they take it to that extreme. I, I mean, you know, in, in Australia, we've, we've got legislation before, the, before our parliament at the moment, and it's uncertain whether it will pass. The government doesn't have the balance of power mm. in, the, in the Senate. They need the support of either the progressives right. or the conservatives. And it seems at both of those ends, there's a lot of hesitancy. So from the progressive end, it's... Um, they're, they're, they're conflicted because it is big tobacco, but they're conflicted that they, they, they think that all drugs should be decriminalised and drugs should be treated as a health issue, so why wouldn't you extend that to nicotine? Um, and then at the other end, at the, the nationals and the farmers, um, they, well, they take donations from big tobacco, so mm. they're sort of like... I, I think it's more simple than that, really, with big tobacco. I think, you know these tobacco controls they, they earn money just like uh, anyone mm. else and i think they need harm and um and i think vaping threatens them because vaping is coming along and it could break up all of the big tobacco that they've been fighting against for years and and they don't like that because they think well what are we going to do if everyone just goes and starts buying things to just quit smoking themselves so i think it's as simple as that they they need they need the enemy they need the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. horned devils of the tobacco industry so i think they'd be sad to see them go i know they would be they wouldn't know what to do with themselves. Yeah. I think they're just, honestly, it's down to tobacco control. I think the people in tobacco control at one point in their lives, and there's so many here at GFN, mm. 
that were in tobacco control and had their aha moment mm -hmm. because maybe it's confidence, maybe it's something else, but the people that are left over are not the best of the best anymore. Mm. They're the leftovers, yeah. and especially in Canada. So you're saying then that there's a red pill moment. <laughs> or you're something getting to too that. deep for me. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> take the red or take the blue, right? So the ones that are left are the ones that chose the blue. I, I think, I've always said, I think there are two ways of looking at people who are in public health. You have the ones in public health who really care about people, and you're the ones who are in it and only in it for the money. And mm. I think what we're seeing in public health is a split between the ones who recognise the potential of this. And even if it does cost them money or lose them grants or whatever, they really want to stop people smoking. And the other, you have the others who are thinking, if these things go ahead, I'm going to be out of a job. Yeah. So you've got a split along those lines, I think, in public health. Well, it's great. Well, thank you very much you. for the elucidating on that whole thing, or maybe hallucinating. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, thank you, everybody, for you know tuning in. And... I don't even know what's next. So oh, Cliff go. Douglas is getting some kind Cliff of award. Douglas Cliff Douglas and the is Mike providing Russell the oration. Mike Russell oration, yes. Sounds great. Well, thank okay. you very much for joining us.